Well, I tell you, I, I, um, I'm still recovering from the last service, and I mean that in a positive way. And, you know, you got the notes. I've got a whole message that I, I won't finish, and I'm not just saying that to be funny. I, I just, you know, I was in the middle of trying to finish what I did last month, as I discussed I would do, and from the very beginning, I could tell there was something off. Um, not in a bad way, I don't think, but just I, there was, there was something that wasn't connecting and I was laboring to communicate. And I have this happen, this happens to me, not all the time, but it's, there's regular times and then I just get to the point, it's like, I'm just gonna stop talking. Because I can sense the spirit is not in what I'm doing. And I can tell the difference between when the spirit is in it and then when I'm just talking. And that just feels naked to me, so I just stop. And the funny thing about it is that it's, it's also embarrassing, right? So I'm, I'm I, you know, I have my notes, I'm looking at the clock, and, you know, we try to, we honor, we want to honor the spirit and also honor people's time at the same time. So we're trying to balance the two. And I'm looking at the clock, and I'm, the clock's about to run out. And in the past, normally what happens, and some of you have been here when it happens, there'll be a long pause. And when that happens, I don't know what's going on. I, in that moment, I feel like, I don't know what's going on. Like I lost my thought, I don't know what I'm gonna say next, and I'm just, you know, Holy Spirit tell me something, everybody's looking at me, waiting for me to say something. <laughs> I don't know what to say, but I don't wanna tell them that. <laughs> and so, you know, and usually what happens is there'll be a long pause for some reason and then the Holy Spirit will give me something to say and it'll connect it all together. Well, that didn't happen this time. And then the time ran out. But I didn't feel led to say anything or stop, and I just, this is, this is awkward. And, but it was the spirit of the Lord. And thankfully, there's other people filled with the spirit here too. You know, uh, Aaron Carter, he just instinctively knew, get it, got on the keys, started playing music. And we just had an extended time of worship and deliverance as people were crying out to the Lord. And it was as if I was talking about it, but God wanted us to experience it. He wanted us to experience his spirit. And that's how the Holy Spirit operates. I mean, he, he, we, have a, we have a concept of in our mind of how things are supposed to go. And we've got good reasons for it. Because, you know, we've got to be on time and we've got to be professional. And we've got to be clear and all these other, I mean, good reasons. But you know what? He doesn't care about that. The Holy Spirit doesn't care about our plans, our agenda, our time, our schedule, our priorities. He does not care. Not in the sense that he doesn't care about us individually, but these things we've imagined that are important, they're not actually important relative to what he wants to do. And he wants us all to be led that way. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get back into this message. I may pick my spots. I may jump around a little bit because I'm just going to be, be, try to honor what I feel the Holy Spirit is doing today. And we'll, we'll, we'll go from there. I know he, he wants to do something special for us. So we'll do this. So the first thing I want to do is to, I want to connect the dots from, the, from when the last time I spoke to now, which I know has been some weeks. Um, so literally, if you have the notes from, I don't think you have them with you right now, but I'm saying you could connect from that last time to this if you wanted to. And I didn't finish what I was saying. And we've actually, you know, Bishop and I are pretty much, you know, he's doing two, I'm doing two messages, and we're trying to, we have themes and things we're trying to keep up with. So technically, we've already moved on to the next subject, but I want to go back and connect the dots with what I was saying before, finish that, and I'm going to be with you for the, next, for, for the next three weeks, so today and the next two Sundays. So I'll have time to make everything connect, but I want to go back and finish the thought, and we'll get back to what we were doing. So... The last thing I was talking about was spiritual parenting and discipleship. And I, the first part of your notes there is to simply review. And as I've indicated before, you can fill in the blanks if you want to. If not, we, we upload the notes uh, online uh, and they'll be available after 12 o'clock on Monday. So if you just want to sit and watch, some people when they're writing all the time, it's difficult for them to kind of focus on the message. So whatever works best for you. So uh, the big idea that I want you to get is this, that we're all responsible for reproducing the character of Christ in others. This is not a singular responsibility on the pastor or the deacons or the elders or the really, you know, the really the spiritual person in, next to you who seems to know the scripture really well. It's for everybody. 
We're, we're all responsible for reproducing Christ's character in other people. And I, 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 I referenced Galatians 4.19. And it said, my little children for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Notice the language Paul is using here. Uh, he's calling these people children. These, these are not children that he conceived. Um, his wife didn't birth these children. Um, but he calls them children. And when he says that, that's, there's a reality to that. Okay? And listen to the metaphor he's using. Obviously, Paul is not a woman here. But he says, for whom I again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. So it's... He's describing the nature of helping other people to grow in Christ, and he says the only appropriate metaphor I can give you is childbirth. That, 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 that rearing children in Christ is like rearing your bi biological children or the children you've adopted or fostered or people living in your home. It's like rearing natural children. And there's something akin to the anguish of childbirth in desiring and praying and travailing for other people's character to be formed like Christ. So our commitment level has to be there. The end goal of parenting, oh, I'm sorry, let me continue. So some of these people that we happen to, uh, that we are discipling, happen, what they have, we happen to have biological ties to them, but from God's perspective, the project is the same. The project is the same. So essentially, and I'm convinced of this, in God's mind, whether or not they are your biological children, if you're helping to rear them spiritually, I believe God looks at it the same way from a parenting standpoint. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I don't think he looks at it any differently. We do because we have we're sentimental value attached to having biological children. I'm sensitive to this because, you know, I, for, for, you know, Marcy and I, we had children about five years later than we wanted to because of infertility dynamics. And I know people who've experienced that either temporary or right now you're trying and you haven't been, or some people have reached a point where there's no longer a practical consideration. So I understand the emotions of that, the frustration, the anger. You get tired of people asking you about it. And, you, you know, people say you're going to have kids and you look at each other and just, you know, it's just all kinds of, it's, it's not fun. It's not fun. You get tired of people praying for you. <laughs> you know, it's just, and you're seeing all the other people experiencing these important um, life experiences that are tied to having children and you're not part of it and it's frustrating. So I understand that, and I don't want to diminish, as I equate to some level, the natural and the spiritual, I don't want to diminish the, 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 the experience of that. And I know I, for a season, I experienced that, so I understand that. All I'm saying is that as far as God is concerned, he wants spiritual children. He wants spiritual children because, because natural children are temporary. That is, our ties to our biological family are temporary if those family members aren't members of the spiritual family. Amen. So the goal is to help other people mature. So the end goal of parenting and natural and spiritual children is for them to grow spiritually. The goal is to help other people mature. And we all have a spiritual legacy to leave behind one way or another, even if you're a single person. You're not married. You have no children. You have a spiritual legacy to leave behind. That's good. Yeah, that's good. You have a spiritual legacy to leave behind. Amen. You have a spiritual legacy to heal. And I hear people sometimes because, you know, they, they're not to have any formal ties with children. So they feel like they don't they're off the hook. They don't have to. You know, that's not my concern. But as we've illustrated that the family of God, that the only way we can mature as a church is for everybody to, as I, the, the, actually I got this phrase from, from, from Marcy, my wife, like pick a child. Pick a child. And when she, said, when she says that to me, you know, I, I, you know in our, our, our situation right now, I, 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 I'm, I work at Biola University. She's at home with the children, and, and she drops me off uh, at work when we drop the kids off. And sometimes, because I, I, I don't have the car throughout the day, you know, as soon as I'm done, I need, there's errands I read, need to run, things I need to do, and I'm thinking, I'm task going, and, going, and, and sometimes, I'm, sometimes I cannot be mindful of the fact that she's been with the kids all day, and I can't just go and run my errands. So she said, look, pick a child. <laughs> Don't just go do what you're going to do. You can take both of them or whatever you're going to do, but pick a child. 
And, and that is what God is saying, that there are spiritual children that are unparented. Yeah. And it's not that they don't have pastoring, it's that, that, that the, 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 a, a pastor can't do it all. Can't connect all the dots. Sunday morning message is not enough. You can't, if, I, if you line up hours of counseling for every person, it's just, it can't happen like that. You have to have other mature people who are pouring into people's lives and they're seeing you say, okay, I got you. Yeah. Yeah. I got you. So God wants us to mature. So our growth is tied to the growth of others. So if we want to grow, we have to help other people grow. And God wants us to mature by imitating his ways directly. That is through his word and his spirit and by imitating people who imitate him. And we talked about that as well. So that's the review. And I I want to get into my message here, but I'm, I'm going to be selective because, you know, I had a really sophisticated explanation of a lot of different things. And I don't sense that that's what I'm going to do right now. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of pick my spots, and it's so interesting. You know, I, you know th- there are times when uh, it seems like the emphasis is on the incredible preparation and everything is this way or that way, and other times the Spirit just interrupts it, which is his prerogative to do is his church, right? <laughs> it's his people. It's his message. He can say what he wants to do. He can do what he wants to do. So I think, I think I'm going to go to this part of my message that is focused on the mat- matters of the heart. I'm going to focus on that here. And so what I want you to do, yes, uh, so there's a passage connected to it. I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to go to this thing. So go to the part where in your notes where it says Jesus identifies the human and the word should be heart as both the problem and implicit solution. Jesus identifies the human heart as both the problem and implicit solution. So Here's what I'm getting, and I'm trying to pull it all together from what the Spirit did first service to now, is that there are some things that the Lord wants to do in our church. There are some things he wants to do in our church. But he really can't do them until our hearts are ready for it. And that, that's exactly what I saw. Like, there are some things, like this, this is a really intricate lesson I had planned, but, you know, you, I can't really teach it the way I want to teach it because everyone's heart's not ready for it. Didn't Jesus say that with his disciples? There's some things I need to tell you, but you're not ready. You ain't ready. You need the Holy Spirit. When you get the Holy Spirit, then we can keep talking. And I'm going to talk to you through him, but you're not ready right now. You want to know, but I can't tell you. And so so I'm going to start here, okay? Jesus identifies the human heart as both the problem and implicit solution. So he's coming off of a conversation he's having with the Pharisees about marriage and divorce, right? And he's, he's, they're, they're, they're trying to like trick him in, 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 in terms of his language. And what he does at the end, and he, it, what he does, he's very, Jesus is amazing the way he navigates the conversation. But he gets to a place where he says, it's, it's, it, this, is a, this is a heart issue. It's not a legal issue. It's not a tradition issue. It's a heart issue. And heart change, okay, when God is after our hearts, he's after, and okay, so I'm, I'm going to use a big word here. I'm saying that because when I say this word, some people are going to know exactly what this is and some people aren't. And I'm not trying to diminish anyone's intelligence here. What I'm pointing to the fact is that, uh, in, in, you know, this word is probably very common with maybe philosophers and mathematicians and academics. Uh, but, but when you hear this word, and again, some people you'll know exactly what it is, other people won't. Um, just understand that every community has specialized vocabulary, right? So if you, if you go, is there a football game on today? No? Because we already have a Super Bowl. Whatever, I, I'm not even keeping up with that. But you know when you, watch, when you watch football, they use a specialized vocabulary. If you haven't played football, they're, they're using all kinds of terms and things. It's like, what in the world is that? Okay? You play basketball, right? If you, talk, you have a casual conversation with, with lawyers, they, they use a certain kind of lingo, or you people, people in construction, whatever it is, uh, whatever like demographic group, they have a specialized vocabulary. That's all this is. But I want to point out this word for, for a reason, okay? So, so, so here we go. Heart change equals presupposition change. Heart change equals presupposition change. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm going to explain to you what a presupposition is. And I, sometimes I don't, 
I don't want to bring words like that here because of where people's minds go. And by that, it means some people will check out when they, it sounds like I'm getting a little bit too academic. So I need to be selective when I do this. But for, th to, for me, this word is so important, I actually want to explain it to you. I'm going to spend time on it, okay? So as I indicated, I'm going to jump around a little bit from, on my notes. So you see that? I say heart change equals presuppos presupposition change. Now so go up in your notes where it says, what is a pre presupposition? I'm going to explain to you. What is a presupposition? So let's break it down. Like, so the pre part, we all know this. Pre is before. Okay. And supposition has to do with an assumption or a belief. Okay. So remember Sesame Street and they, 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 uh, 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 they had the syllables and they put them together, put the word together and you pronounce the whole word. So let's put it together, right? So basically a presupposition is something you believe beforehand. Something you believe beforehand. It's a foundational belief about reality that sits in the background of your mind. This is important because your presuppositions, everything else you believe is based on those presuppositions. Everything else. And the funny thing about them is that you, don't, you, don't, you may not even know you have them. You, you don't think about them most of the time. You just operate as if those things are true. So, for example, in a Christian community, and sometimes even when you're as a Christian out in your job or whatever, you, you act as if God exists. You don't, like, explain this to people, like, how could he exist? Like, it's just, just, it's just a presupposition, a foundational belief, and you live accordingly. So you might do something, something happens, you be like, oh, thank God. But you're not just saying that. You're actually thanking God because you, you're just assuming God's real. This didn't happen on my own. God has something to do with it. It's a presupposition. Amen. Now, I did my undergraduate work at UCLA and my graduate work at USC, and especially at USC, when in my classes, people didn't share the presupposition that God exists. They shared the presupposition, most of them, that God didn't exist. And here's the thing with the presupposition. It wasn't as if they were saying, you know, there's probably some other people in here who are of faith, let's try to be respectful. Some people believe, some people don't. Let's have this conversation. In many cases, it wasn't that. It was, you walked in and it was understood God didn't exist. The Bible is a myth. There's no conversation about this. There's no like, is there anyone here who actually does believe? It's like, we do all understand God's not real. It was their presupposition. And, you know, I was, uh, I when I was at SC, I had just come out of undergrad. I was still, in my mind, still a kid in some ways. So I wasn't ready to respond all the time. But there were times when I did speak up, and I said, well, there's, there is someone who does believe yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd have to say something. Because I believe this stuff for real. Yeah. Now, so... Believing in God, not believing in God, that's one kind of presupposition. But there's other kinds of presuppositions that are personal, like can't trust people. Has somebody ever have someone say that? And sometimes they don't articulate it, but you know that's their presupposition. That's how they operate in life. They don't get close to people. They're always trying to get a little bit ahead or on top of, they're trying to get around or navigate because they're anticipating someone's going to burn them. But that's their presupposition. So that's, that's how their life is navigated. Some people live from a standpoint of they feel their life is a deficit, so they always have to impress people. So their presupposition is I'm not good enough, and people probably won't like me, so I have to. So the result is they overcompensate. They may not even know that they're thinking they have a deficit, but it is in there. If you keep asking them questions, it's like, I don't feel like I'm, it's a presupposition. A presupposition defines reality for you. Okay, now I'm going to go back to that place I was before where it said Jesus identifies the human heart as the problem and implicit solution. I'm going to go back to that space, okay? Now look at this. A presupposition is a rule. It's a rule. I say this because there's a, there's a wonderful book called How to Think Like Einstein 
And in that book, it, it, it tries to break down the way Einstein thought. How, how did he come up with the theory of relativity? How did he discover these things? And what, what it said was that Einstein was a rule breaker. But it was less about breaking other people's rules and more about breaking his own rules. So the book talks about people being in a, and I'll read this here, a, God wants to get you out of your rule rut. Right. There's rules you created for yourself that say this is true, this is valid, this is real. Yeah. But it's not like you've proved that that's the case, it's just you've decided that that's what it is. For your reasons. And what the book was saying is that there are problems that need to be solved that go beyond your rules. But you have to be willing to break your rules. Amen. See, earlier this service, there was some, earlier in the first service, there was something God wanted to do in people's hearts that broke the rules of the service. There was a clock. We were running out of time. I hadn't finished my message. If, if, I, if I operated by my own rules, I'd say, this is embarrassing. I'm looking like I'm not competent. The clock is running out. What are people going to think? Those are my rules. But to follow the spirit, I had to break my rules. It's not, I'm not talking about breaking the law. I'm not talking about doing something unethical or immoral. I'm talking about your rules. We all have them. Our own private rules for what's true and right and good that aren't God's but ours. We created them. And so God wants to, when he's after our hearts, he's after those rules. Yeah. Yeah. In Proverbs 4.23, it says, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. But what we could say is this, right? Out of your heart flow the springs or rules of life, your rules. In your heart, we, we have rules that govern our behavior, our decisions, how much we're willing to trust, how much we're willing to, to rely on the Lord or other people. Look at Mark eleven twenty three. 23. It says, truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that he that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Notice the words doubt and heart. In other words, your mountain moves once your rules about mountains change. All right. All right. It's not the mountain, it's your rules. You think a mountain has to move this way. It's a lot of ways to move a mountain. And because it's not following your rules, you think it's impossible. See, doubt is really belief or rule about the opposite outcome. A doubt is nothing but a belief or a rule about the opposite outcome. And some people have more belief in the opposite outcome than the thing that they're believing for, that they want. So we just got to change our rules. But to change those rules, we need God's help. We need God's help. David invited the Lord. He said, search my heart in Psalms 139. Last couple verses, I think 23 and 24. It's not on the list, but, but, but it, search my heart. See if there's anything wicked in here. Because I don't know that I don't know. I don't know that I have these rules. I don't know that I'm self-sabotaging myself. I don't know that. I don't know that I have, and you can look this up. This is another term, com a competing commitment. That I say one thing and do another. Why? Because there's these rules that are actually governing me that are different than what I think I believe in. And I got to get down to them. And they're so deep, I need the Holy Spirit to help me. Yeah. Which means I have to keep my heart open for him. Yeah. Which means he has to deal with some areas I've been keeping closed. Which means I got to go back to some things I've been hiding from him and other people. Go to this, so go down your notes where it says, pray that you have a heart like David. 
Pray that you have a heart like David. He was a man who struggled with sexual sin, but who was a man after God's heart and who loved God's law, that is, his rules. Okay? So, so God wants to take out your rules and put in his rules. That's what he wants to do. In fact, Proverbs talks about write these on the tablet of your heart. His rules, his law. Because the things that we're going to be talking about as a church and moving forward are things that are tied to his law. But his law has to be in your heart. It can't just be something you hear with your ears or something you hear on Sunday. You have to let his laws be in your heart. That means you have to surrender up your laws. My way of being and doing right. Jesus is all kind of lovable until he actually wants to change our rules. Everybody likes Jesus, right? Until, until that point. You know, Jesus prophesied this. He said, the world will hate you because it hates me. And the reason why the world hates Jesus is because he changes their rules. Yeah. Jesus says, my rules. Yes. My rules. Yes. My rules. Look at 1 Samuel 13 and 14. It says, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. David was a man after his own heart. He wasn't perfect. But God can deal with imperfect if he has your heart. If he has your heart, he can deal with imperfect. He can deal with made some mistakes. He can deal with I'm not always the way I need to be. But if you have, if he has your heart, he can work with you. Amen. Amen. First Samuel 16, 7, it says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature. Because I have refused him. That is, he's refused Saul, the one that looks like on the outside would be the better king. He looks like the better king, but God says no. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wanted to, do I want to go here? Um, I, I'll just say it. Part of what I wanted to address today, and this was the, the, the difficult part for me because I know I was going to attempt to address a sensitive issue with respect to parenting and family. I'm going to talk a little bit about the kind of uh, contemporary conversation we're having about marriage and sexuality, and which is partly why I had this elaborate lesson plan because I wanted to be all precise and what have you. Um, but, but here's what I wanted to get at. You know, as, as Christians, and I should say, evangelical Christians in particular. And, and when I say evangelical Christian, I mean it in a very limited sense. I don't mean it in a political sense at all. Um, for me, evangelical has to do with particular doctrinal points, uh, one of which believe in the inerrancy of scripture in its original translation, believing in the basic gospel message, things that nature. I know in our contemporary time, evangelical Christian has connotations tied to it and for some people, even if they believe in those things, they don't want to have the title because they don't like the politics about it. So I'm not here to talk about the politics. I'm just here to talk about, I'm just using evangelical to talk about some doctrinal things here. But I'm saying people in the evangelical community, we get offended by people's outward appearance. We get offended when people appear to be living outside what we understand to be God's law. We don't like it. And I, I can't speak to every person, but I'm just generally speaking with the evangelical community. And so these attitudes get played out in public and politics and all that. I'm not here to talk about all that stuff. But, you know, what I'm seeing in our society today is that 
You have different groups of people essentially bullying each other through legislation. I'm going to make you do what I want you to do. I'm going to get a judge to do this or a congressperson to do that from, from all sides of the equation. And we all know, don't we, that no judge is going to change who someone's attracted to, nor will it change someone's religious conviction. So regardless of the judge and the law, we still got to be grown-ups. Right. Still got to be grown-ups. What I wanted to say earlier is that what's interesting about the scripture is that it, there's nothing in it that talks about pray the gay away. There's no, there's no, there's no, there's no phrase, there's no command, there's, there's nothing like that. There's no phrase like that. Sexual orientation isn't even a category in Scripture. Gay marriage isn't a category. It's, it's just not a category in Scripture. They're all passages that talk about sexual practices, but it talks about practices, a range of sexual practices that are outside the marriage union between a man and a woman. It does talk about that, but there's no conversation about a transgender identity or a gay identity. It is not a category. Do you know what God is preoccupied with? If I use the scripture as the basis, it's not orientation change. That's a human category. That's a human category. That's what human knowledge, psychologists, sociologists, anthropologists, what have you, have categorized as a human category. That's not Bible category. You know what God is concerned with? Heart change. Heart change. He says, let me change your heart. Let me change your heart. Because if I can change your heart, I can change you. You have rules about what's real, about what's true. You have human categories of identity. But I want you to accept my categories. It's not who you say you are, it's who I say you are. But we have to allow him to put that on our heart. Now, in the meantime, there are people in our Christian community who they subscribe to what the Bible is teaching, as I'm saying, but they have same-sex attractions or they feel at odds with their sexual identity with respect to their bodies. I'm not denying the reality of that. God's not saying that's real. What the Bible is saying is, the Bible isn't adopting the categories humans put around those things. That's a human thing. What God is saying is, let me change your heart. So in the meantime, when our brothers and sisters are part of our congregation who you find out one way or another, subscribe to this, but also have a life in which they would say, hey, I've got same-sex attractions or my body's different than what I am on the inside, that's how I feel. We got to be patient, and we can't judge. Because we look at the outside, but God looks at the heart, and God's saying, you don't know what I'm doing in that person. Because the requirement for entering into God's community is not your orientation, but your faith. Do you believe my word? Do you believe my word? Walk by faith and not by sight. This is what I say you are. You may not feel it. You may not, it may not seem like it's going that way. But if you can believe me, God says that all, all those who receive Jesus and believe on his name to them gave the right to become the children of God. See, it's in John 1. Uh, 112. Amen. It's faith. Yeah, yeah. Amen. And watch how God 
walks along your journey as you allow his heart to be your heart. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Let's pray. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So this morning, this, this afternoon, God is clearly after our hearts. He, he's preoccupied with it, actually. Of all the things God talks about changing in our lives in the Bible, the heart is mentioned the most. We try to rationalize things. We try to like, well, how, well how's God going to do that? And how is he going to do this? Don't worry about that. Give him your heart. <laughs> what if this happens or that happens? Don't worry about that. Give God your heart. So that's my first ask right now. If there's anyone sitting here today, um, and you've not given God your heart. I mean that in a couple of ways. Some of, so for some of the people I'm mentioning that to, you're a person who, you know, you really just haven't been a follower of Jesus. And maybe you've been a, a you know, you've been a church attender or you've, you participated in Christian traditions, but you, you yourself have not been a follower of Jesus. That's one level. But some of you, for all intents and purposes, you have been a follower of Jesus. But you've not really given him your heart. There's a piece of you that has just, you've not given to him. And sometimes, it's, you know people can actually be offended at God? There are people, who, they, they genuinely believe in God, and they are offended at him because of something they, he allowed or something someone in church did. Some of the biggest critics of the church are people who were once in church and got offended. But God doesn't want you to look at the church through your pain because that's a rule you've created in your heart because of your offense. He wants you to look at what he's doing First of all, this is his church. When you, when you criticize his church, you're criticizing him. He, the church was his idea. He chose to use imperfect people. Because again, God is not hung up on imperfect as long as he can get your heart. He uses people whose heart is after them, them even if they're imperfect. But this afternoon, you have an opportunity to release your heart to the Lord. He knows it hurt. He knows you're guarded. But he also knows that if you let it go, there's so much he can do for you. So if you're a person here today, and again, you may, you're either a person who has not been a follower of Jesus at all, or you have been a follower of Jesus, but you've not given him your heart. If everyone in, at this point, too, could bow their heads and close their eyes, too, and give people privacy. I just want you to raise your hand if that's the case. If anything I said resonate with you, resonated with you, I want you to raise your hand. I see that hand. Oh, okay. I see that hand. You can put it down. Anyone else? Secondly, is there anyone here and you're not sure where you stand with the Lord? That's really a funny thing to say because some people, how can I say this? They try to be unclear on purpose. Because once they allow themselves to be clear, they have to deal with some things. Some of us like to be in uncertainty and ambiguity. We like to be in places in which things aren't settled because it doesn't, because then we don't have to get settled. 
We don't have to commit. We don't have to be real. We don't have to be honest if everything's always in disarray and uncertainty. But for some of us, that uncertainty and ambiguity is something that we're creating to hide from God. So if you're here today and you've been hiding from God in your ambiguity and uncertainty and you want to come clean, you want to say, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of playing the games. God, I want you. Let's do this. Anyone here, you're either unsure about where you stand with God or you know you've been trying to be unsure so you don't have to deal with him. Anyone here? Thirdly, is there anyone here and you want to recommit to Jesus? One of my favorite aspects of the Christian life is the do-over button. I, I don't play as many video games now as I did in the past, but one of the things I loved about video games is if, you, if things weren't going too well, you press the refresh button, you start all over. New game. And that sounds like that's taking advantage of God, but let me tell you that, like that, he 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 takes pleasure in like, okay, let's just start over. Today's a new day. It's a new day. It's a new morning. We start fresh. God never loses interest. He never gets tired of pursuing us, and he's always in anticipation of what you and he can do together. Is there anyone here and you want to recommit your life to Jesus? You want to start over? You want to start over? Is there anyone here this morning? And I know, you know, when I'm talking, I know there's people who you're, 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 you're mulling over this. And, I, and I'm not saying, I see that hand. Put it down. You're mulling over things. And I'm not saying this to, to, to uh, put pressure on you because I'm not, I'm not going to extend the invitation indefinitely. But I am going to put it out there. I know there are people mulling over this. But I'm, I'm, I'm here this morning to impress upon you how, how eagerly God wants to be in relationship with you. But he can't if your heart is hard. He just can't. He just he can't talk to you like he wants to. He can't even respond to some of your requests. For some of us, it's their issues of unforgiveness and resentment and bitterness. And some of them are at, are at big levels, but, you know, there's also levels of, of unforgiveness that have to do with subtleties. Like there's just something quite right with that, another person. He wants to deal with all that. So there's a lot at stake in coming to Jesus because you means you got to change. But the beauty of that is that he gives, he gives us his spirit to be empowered to do this. And that's the next thing I want to say is that some of us need more of the Holy Spirit. We need more of the Holy Spirit. We need more of the Holy Spirit. We need more of the Holy Spirit. There's some, you know, God is so patient with us. He lets us go along for a long time thinking we're actually doing this on our own. He will allow us to think that we're actually doing this on our own when we're not. We need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowers us. The Holy Spirit gives us a supernatural language. The Bible, we understand it in the Bible to be speaking in other tongues. I'm going to make another appeal and then I'll say one final thing here. The other opportunity you have is to become a member of this church. Church membership is not merely about having more people in the seats. It is about a community. It is about a family. You cannot be a Christian, a good Christian, 
and be a hermit and be by yourself. You need a church community. And if you don't already have one, we want to invite you to be part of ours. Is there anyone here who would like to become a member of this church? So I, I don't want to belabor the point. I, I, just, I just know there's people here who haven't responded with a hand raised, but you're mulling this over. So normally what I do, I have people stand up and applaud as people come down to encourage you. but. I'm going to do this. With everyone's still bowing their heads in prayer, if you raised your hand or you didn't raise your hand, but you want to respond to this in some way, I just want you to come up. to the front for some of you represents the kind of emotional risk you have to continue to take to allow more of God in your life. So it's he's demonstrating to you how much he still has you even when you're vulnerable. That's what we're going to do. I'm going to be here next week. I'm going to be here the week afterwards. What I want you to do is this week, this is what I want you to pray. Simple prayer. Lord, help me. Some of you are mulling it over and you don't know how. You, you just, you, your mind hasn't wrapped around, you, you haven't wrapped your mind around it. I just want you to pray this week. Lord, help me. Jesus, help me. Say it as many times as you can in your prayer time throughout the day. Lord, help me. Jesus, help me. Not in the, not in the kind of saying the Lord in vain way, but really you're asking him for his help. Because he wants to get your heart. And if we have to do this in pieces, we will. Amen? Amen.